come over with a celebration gift of $5,000. Oh, but you're from a single parent family with your sister, that might be impossible. Hearing Tracy's voice over the phone, she talks to me in a challenging tone. The idea of a celebration gift of $5,000 is beyond common sense. Of course, I have no intention of giving such an amount. Especially after she stole my husband. Ben, the idea of giving her money for a baby shower is out of the question. Hey, are you listening? Come over to my house this Sunday. The baby is incredibly cute, resembling both Ben and me, very much so. As I silently listened to Tracy's voice, I caught the eye of my father, who looked at me with a slightly anxious expression. My father, now quite aged, looked at me with kind eyes. After disowning Tracy for stealing my husband, my father, in his anger, cut down the gardenia tree planted in celebration of Tracy giving birth. What remained was my gardenia tree, which, from a young age, Tracy had forcibly pruned to the point where it no longer bloomed, now only has blue leaves. No matter the season, the rich and vibrant fragrance that once filled our home will never spread again. That's fine. I'll go with my husband. He's a doctor. What? A doctor? That's some grand delusion you're boasting about. Well, I guess I'll look forward to it. Suddenly, I look up at the sky through the window. The bright gray clouds and the dark. Cloudy sky before the rain are clearly divided, swirling above me. My name is Vanessa. Blessed with a kind husband and daughter, I live a happy, albeit ordinary, life. I have a sister named Tracy, 16 years younger than me. She has always been strong-willed. Throwing tantrums whenever things don't revolve around her since she was young. I remember it was around the rainy season before I got married and left my parents' house. In our family garden, the gardenia tree planted at my birth had grown to the height of an adult. Meanwhile, the gardenia tree planted when Tracy was born was still knee-high and small. As a birth commemoration tree, it was natural for Tracy's gardenia to be small. But she seemed to be quite bothered by this. During a clear spell in the rainy season, as I looked up at the sky from a window, a fragrant scent of gardenia wafted through. The clear sky soon clouded over, and the chirping of sparrows in the garden became tangled. But that elegant fragrance made me involuntarily close my eyes. It smells nice. Vanessa, where's it coming from? Taking the hand of Tracy, then in her early years of elementary school, I led her to the blooming gardenia in the garden. Approaching the small white flowers blooming on the gardenias planted side by side. We were met with a strong, sweet fragrance. Tracy, looking at the white flowers, quickly pointed and puffed her cheeks, saying. My tree isn't blooming. Since the flowers had stopped blooming the previous year. My father suspected root binding and dug up only my commemorative tree once to replace the soil. Which seemed to have helped. However, he did not do the same for Tracy's gardenia. According to my father, it's scary if it fails, so let's experiment with Vanessa's tree first. Tracy, who immediately threw a tantrum and started crying, frustrated my father to no end. He did not take measures because he didn't want to risk killing Tracy's commemorative tree. But my gardenia blooming seemed to have offended Tracy nonetheless. Frustrated and shouting things like, it's not fair. Vanessa gets everything. She cut off all the flowers from the gardenia tree with scissors. When no one was looking and arranged a large number of gardenia flowers in a vase. Saying with a beaming smile, pretty isn't it? Surrounded by an overwhelmingly intense fragrance, it was a pity. But we ended up stuffing all the flowers into a bag and throwing them away. Tracy showed no remorse, and I bent down to scold her at her level. Tracy, flowers are living things too, you shouldn't cut them recklessly. Humph, <clears throat> whatever. And Vanessa, your face is scary, so don't come close. 
Called scary, I involuntarily stepped back. I have a two-inch scar on my forehead, a significant complex for me. Despite knowing that I was conscious of it. Tracy would intentionally make remarks about being scared. If we had been sisters closer in age, I probably would have exploded in anger. But Tracy felt more like a daughter than a sister to me. At that moment, what I felt was not anger but sadness that someone could say such hurtful words with a nonchalant face. However, I was not mature enough at the time to explain this to Tracy. Tracy, with her slightly twisted personality, dramatically changed a few years later after I got married and gave birth. I was blessed with a daughter named Emma with my husband, Ben. When I brought Emma home, Tracy looked at her with wonder, as if she was seeing an alien on the bed. Tracy was a middle school student when she first met baby Emma. In the midst of puberty, Tracy, who had a subtle distance from me and our parents, kept gazing at the peacefully sleeping Emma and cherished her greatly as she grew a little older. Tracy treated Emma like a younger sister and Emma adored Tracy as an older sister. My parents and I were happy that Tracy had become a very kind and gentle woman. Still, her inherent strong-willed nature remained, seemingly emitting an aura that kept ordinary boys at bay. And she appeared to enjoy being single, saying, I don't want to get married anyway. The gardenia trees in the garden continued to grow vigorously. Their leaves lush and green, and the two trees standing side by side looked very charming. However, my gardenia tree, pruned by Tracy when she was young, never bloomed again. Over time, Emma gradually became fed up with what could be called Tracy's arrogance or selfish temperament. As Emma grew, by the time she was in middle school, she began to show signs of avoiding Tracy, who had been so close to her. Since the apartment where my husband, my daughter, and I lived was near my parents' house, and we visited quite frequently, Emma's attitude towards Tracy became suddenly apparent. Tracy herself, noticing Emma's attitude of not adoring her, stopped paying attention to Emma. Then, on a winter evening, although the day continued with cold rain, it stopped in the evening, revealing a starry sky. That day was Tracy's birthday, and our family gathered at our parents' house. While having dinner together, whenever Tracy talked to Emma, she looked displeased. And when the topic shifted to Tracy herself, she seemed bored and went out to sit on the porch where the garden was visible. I sat next to Emma, looking at the garden together. The winter porch was very cold, so I covered both Emma and myself with a blanket. Emma, you've seemed down lately. Is there something worrying you? Yeah. Um, mom. Just as Emma was about to say something. Ben came from the living room and cheerfully sat cross-legged next to Emma, holding a can of beer in one hand and perhaps a bit drunk. He looked up at Emma's face with a flushed cheek, exaggeratingly. Emma, if you have any worries, talk to me. It's okay, Dad. Emma responded in a subdued voice. Hey, hey, isn't it too early to be troubled by love? You have high school entrance exams to worry about, don't you? The moment Ben tried to comfort her by touching her shoulder, Emma suddenly snatched the beer can from him and threw it into the garden. I was left gaping as Emma sternly told Ben, don't touch me. Hearing the loud voice, Tracy and our parents came to the porch. Emma, trembling, eventually jumped into my chest and started crying. What's wrong, Emma? I go to tutoring school, right? The one in front of the station. Yes. That's right. There's a hotel near the station. I saw Dad and Tracy coming out of it together. Hearing this, I widened my eyes and turned my gaze towards Ben. Ben showed a look of shock, and Tracy covered her mouth with her hand, eyes wide open. A long silence followed. Emma silently stood up and said, I'll go home first, then left the house. 
After seeing Emma off at the entrance, I asked Ben in a quiet voice if he had an affair. And Ben admitted it, albeit with a somewhat awkward gesture. Well, it's just that Tracy is younger, and she doesn't have a scar on her face. It was a moment of madness. Tracy was also up for it, so it just happened. Ben, after finishing his explanation, scratched his temple with a finger, showing a bitter smile. Pushing past Ben standing in the hallway, I looked down at Tracy sitting on the porch. Noticing my gaze, Tracy silently raises her face and pouts. Ben was also frustrated, you know? It can't be helped, can it? That's just how men are, right? I was going to tell you eventually. If you divorce him, we can get married right away. Are you out of your mind? Do you really think marrying Ben will make you happy? Tracy tilts her head in dissatisfaction, as if lacking in imagination. Despite stealing her own sister's husband and being disowned by our parents. Tracy wraps her arms around Ben, who is awkwardly hiding. Sorry, sis. I've already decided. You'll bless us, right? Tracy looks at me with eyes full of excitement. I open my mouth to say something but can't. Just staring at Tracy's smiling face. Our parents, overhearing the conversation, explode in anger, yelling at Tracy and Ben on my behalf. They say everything I couldn't bring myself to, and I find no words to blame Tracy and Ben. Without holding back because they are family. I decisively claim compensation from Tracy and Ben and take custody of Emma. It seems Tracy has been badmouthing me to Emma, but Emma didn't listen. She had already closed her heart to Tracy, who spoke ill of me. And Tracy had said to Ben, let's not fight over custody, okay? Ben and Tracy resign from their jobs and decide to start a management consulting firm together. Ben's resignation is for the startup and Tracy plans it as a marriage retirement. Boasting about snatching her real sister's husband, earning disdain from those around them. However, they seem not to care about the disapproval from others. Acting as if they hadn't been yelled at, they visited our parents' home. Impressing me with their audacity. Eventually, our parents declare to disown them. Forbidding them from crossing the threshold of our home again. I was a housewife while living with Ben, but I had worked as a nurse before our marriage. A friend, aware of my situation, invites me to work as a nurse at an orthopedic clinic. Working hard with the goal of raising Emma well on my own, the clinic's director. A well-respected doctor, notices the scar on my forehead and mentions that it could be treated. But I refuse the treatment. Right now, I'm focusing on working hard to raise my daughter well. The director, moved by my words, sometimes gives me cookies that Emma likes. Such as bear-shaped cookies that are popular among middle schoolers, a kind gesture. From a considerate doctor. Five years pass in this busy life. One day, while I'm at my parents' house, Tracy calls to announce she has given birth. Despite everything, Tracy is still my real sister. The news of her giving birth is genuinely joyous, and I whisper. Congratulations, hearing her cheerful voice on the other end. Come over with a celebration gift of $5,000. Oh, but you're being from a single parent family with your sister, that might be impossible. The idea of a celebration gift of $5,000 is beyond common sense. Of course, I have no intention of giving such an amount. Especially after she stole my husband. Ben, the idea of giving her money for a baby shower is out of the question. Hey, are you listening? Come over to my house this Sunday. The baby is incredibly cute, resembling both Ben and me, very much so. As I silently listen to Tracy's voice, I catch my father's eye looking at me with a slightly anxious expression. My father, now quite aged, looks at me with kind eyes. After disowning Tracy, my father, in his anger, cut down the gardenia tree planted in celebration of Tracy's birth. What remains is my gardenia tree, which, 
from a young age. Tracy had forcibly pruned to the point where it no longer bloomed, now only has blue leaves. No matter the season. The rich and vibrant fragrance that once filled our home will never spread again. That's fine. I'll go with my husband, he's a doctor. What? A doctor? That's some grand delusion you're boasting about. Well, I guess I'll look forward to it. Suddenly, I look up at the sky through the window. The expansive bright gray clouds and the dark, cloudy sky before the rain are clearly divided, tumultuously swirling above me. Next Sunday, I decided to go to Tracy's house. Normally busy with work and not much for makeup, today, I meticulously dressed up. I even bought a dress specifically for today and wore the pearl necklace my mother gave me. Reaching for the heels on the top shelf of the shoe rack, I completed my full armor. As a final touch, I took out a bottle of perfume from the drawer. Accompanied by the cheesy line, I think this suits you, I lightly applied the gardenia perfume. A gift from a benefactor, to my wrists and ankles before leaving the house. Hearing that I was invited to Tracy's house, Emma also wanted to come along. When we arrived at Tracy's house, we pressed the doorbell. Tracy's home, a somewhat worn-down second-hand house. Contrasted with the luxury car parked in the driveway, filling me with a slight sadness. When the front door opened, Tracy greeted me with a beaming smile and a hug. Sis. You really came. I actually admire you for that. Thanks for the invitation. Shall we go inside? Of course. It's been a while, Emma. And as for the so-called fantasy doctor. Tracy froze when she saw the tall man smiling behind us. His name is Jeff, the director of the orthopedic clinic where I work, and my husband. During my long tenure, Jeff asked me out. But I declined, wanting to focus on working hard to properly raise Emma. In high school, Emma spent every week working part-time and eventually handed me her savings, suggesting I use it to treat the scar on my forehead. Hearing this, Jeff insisted, please let me perform the surgery. He perfectly healed the scar on my forehead. After the surgery, when the bandage covering the wound was removed, I looked at my own face in the mirror and tears streamed down my face. There I was, scar or no scar, unchanged. Jeff, present during the moment the bandage was removed, handed me a small bag containing a bottle of perfume. It was the gardenia perfume, reminiscent of my favorite gardenia scent we had once discussed. Kneeling before me in the clinic's medical room, Jeff looked up at me. Vanessa, you're the perfect woman who captivates my heart. I want to be with you until my last breath. Yes, wow. I burst into laughter at his overly narcissistic proposal. And so, my husband Jeff joined Emma and me in visiting Tracy's house. Settling into the living room chairs. There was a baby crib in Tracy's house. And she briefly introduced us to the peacefully sleeping child. As Tracy efficiently prepared something in the kitchen, she asked us what we'd like to drink. Jeff and Emma responded with, whatever you recommend, and I said anything was fine. Tracy placed a mug of deliciously smelling coffee before Jeff, poured orange juice for Emma, and, oddly enough, served me tea. She didn't prepare anything for Ben. After serving the drinks, Tracy bombarded Jeff with questions about his background and what made me fall for him. Almost interrogating him. Jeff is tall, always smiling kindly, and a doctor. Moreover, he has the certain look that Tracy seems to prefer. Tracy looked visibly upset, sighing as she compared Ben and Jeff. Poor guy, I thought, feeling a bit sorry for Ben, now someone else's husband. Jeff has that mixed look definitely handsome, but he has a very unique sounding name, doesn't he? Like Baumkachin? No. Copenhagen or something. What kind of name is that? Copenhagen is the capital of Denmark. 
Knowing Jeff's grandfather was English, I suppose there's a connection to Europe. But still, it made no sense. Isn't that too rude to say to Jeff on their first meeting? Tracy seemed quite flustered, probably because Jeff was her type. Trying hard to flirt with him despite her befuddled thoughts. Jeff smiled throughout the encounter. Tracy, in a panic, said, I need to use the restroom, and left the room. When she returned a few minutes later, her makeup was noticeably thicker, leaving me astounded. Then, placing her hand on Jeff's shoulder, Tracy suddenly leaned in close to his ear. Such a handsome face, and a doctor too, my sister really doesn't deserve you. Would you like to go on a date with me sometime? Emma and I look at Tracy with dismay, while Ben is the only one with a look of despair. I thought no sane man would fall for such a brazen invitation, but then again. Perhaps Ben had once been swayed by a similar facile approach. But well, that's beside the point. It's a flattering invitation, but I already have a precious partner in Vanessa. You are very beautiful, and I'm sure a date with you would be enjoyable. Maybe in the next life, you could ask me again? Tracy looks up with tear-filled eyes, seemingly captivated. I calmly sip the tea Tracy prepared, thinking. What a farce this is. Jeff is fully briefed on what kind of person Tracy is. He also knows about the scar on my forehead. Which I got from protecting a young Tracy from a stray dog that had broken free from its collar. Tracy points at my healed face and laughs, that was your badge of honor. Effectively killing the mood. It's a blessing in disguise that it was your face and not my cute one that got injured, right? Hey, auntie. Emma says quietly. For Tracy, being called a auntie is taboo. Despite teaching Emma never to use that word from a young age. Emma deliberately calls Tracy that. Tracy stops moving with a strained smile and silently stares at Emma. I'm really sorry to say this, especially when you seem so happy with your child. But I found something unbelievable recently. What's that? Emma takes out her smartphone and tilts the screen so Ben and she can see. A video of Tracy engaging in dubious activities is displayed. And the moment Tracy realizes she's the one in the video. She reflexively snatches the phone from Emma and hides it. Hey. What's this? How? How? It's not really a question of how. I was just using the internet normally when I stumbled upon a woman who looked like you. So, the person in this video is, actually you? Jeff and I exchange glances and shrug. We were informed by Emma before coming here that she had found a shocking video. Of Tracy online. But I had insisted she shouldn't mention it. There's nothing to gain from cornering Tracy like this, it would only make her resentful. But Emma shook her head decisively and said. I would speak up when the time was right. Definitely. Her expression was no longer that of the young girl I once knew. She now had the face of a mature adult. And now, Emma has revealed Tracy's secret. Ben snatches the smartphone from Tracy, recognizing his wife on the screen. And is silent for a moment before uttering, seriously. Wait a minute. Then, the child? Does that mean the child isn't mine? Of course, it is. It was just work. I got paid to act in fiction. You're out of your mind if you think it's okay. To appear in something like that without telling me. For once, Ben is genuinely angry and confronts Tracy while Jeff, still smiling pleasantly, stands up and suggests to me and Emma, let's go home. As we leave the house, Tracy and Ben's shouting can still be heard even as we walk away. The scent of gardenias wafts from a nearby garden, and soon it starts to rain, prompting us to run to the station. Reaching the station out of breath, we suddenly start laughing. Why are we laughing? There's no specific reason. It just seemed funny to us. Even as passers-by on the station platform give us curious looks, we continue to laugh. 
The elegance of the perfume Jeff gave me seemingly out of place with the current me. Making me laugh even more. Later, I heard from relatives that Tracy's child was confirmed to be Ben's through a DNA test. However, unable to accept Tracy's actions captured in the video with numerous men, Ben filed for divorce. The baby ended up being raised at Ben's family home. But Ben himself was kicked out and came to us seeking reconciliation. However, since I was already married to Jeff, I firmly refused. Afterward, Ben's life spiraled into despair, leading him down a path of loneliness. Eventually becoming homeless. Tracy, enraged that I was leading a better life started matchmaking but was shot down due to the scandalous videos from her past and her problematic health. She ended up obsessing over nightclubs. My ex-husband became homeless and my sister became infatuated with guys from nightclubs. I wonder where things went wrong. My father, not yet of advanced age, chose to move into a well-regarded nursing home nearby due to his deteriorating mobility. Now, my mother lives alone in our family home. Planning to join my father at the nursing home when the time comes. And is currently sorting through the household in preparation. When I heard about my parents' decisions, I felt a bit lonely but also deeply respected their choices. To support my mother, now alone in our family home, Emma, Jeff, and I often visit. On a clear day, after a long rainy season, I asked Jeff to help weed the garden at the family home. Emma helped too, while my mother and I watched them work. Mother, what kind of tree is this? He was pointing to a gardenia tree. Despite being over 40 years old and well past its expected lifespan, the gardenia continued to bear green leaves. My parents weren't particularly interested in plants. The gardenia had been left to grow on its own, yet it miraculously survived all these years. It's possible that Tracy's youthful attempts at harvesting the flowers inadvertently acted as pruning, contributing to this miracle. When my mother explained to Jeff that the tree was a gardenia and that its flowers hadn't bloomed again since Tracy cut them, he nodded thoughtfully. My mother, looking at the gardenia, suddenly burst into laughter. When I asked her why, she shook her head in amusement. She recalled a time shortly after I was born. When my father suggested planting a commemorative tree. They chose a gardenia for its lovely scent and because it was my father's favorite flower. However, a mean-spirited uncle in our family said. Upon seeing the newly planted gardenia in our garden. Planting a gardenia in a girl's home means she'll never get married. I smirked a little. It was a familiar story. An old wives tale associating the name gardenia. With a play on words suggesting a daughter would remain unmarried. Jeff, having finished mowing the garden, stood up and dusted off his hands. What a fascinating superstition. Let's plant a gardenia in our garden as well. Did you listen to the story? Planting a gardenia might delay Emma's marriage. That's fine with me. I've only recently become part of Emma's family. I want the three of us to live together for a much longer time. I chuckled, wondering what nonsensical thing he was saying. But my mother gently placed her hand on my shoulder and smiled. You chose someone very much like your father. Emma, pretending not to hear and slightly embarrassed, continued mowing. In the garden, with a non-blooming gardenia, only the scent I wore filled the air.